Okay. And um, Arkwright. Arkwright. So, uh, Francesco Burelli, I'm, I'm Italian. My name and my accent are giving me away. Um, and I work with uh, a boutique strategy firm called Arkwright Consulting. Uh, that's uh, a Nordic spin off from one of the, the big strategy houses. Um, so, what else to, to say? Being in business, uh, oh God, so long. No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I was, in H I was in Midland Bank, so that is giving away my, my age, and I got out as HSBC, and, um, and then been in consulting with uh, bigger and smaller companies ever, ever since. Um, working practically globally, uh, I'm currently based in Dubai. Uh, my office is in Hamburg, clients are absolutely everywhere. And then uh, in addition to, to working uh, as a consultant, I am a learning, what is called a learning coach, practically an assistant with INSEAD executive education across uh, digital transformation, fintech, strategy, and uh, innovation. Uh, been, been around there for, for three years. Okay. Um, I, I think the first topic we'll take uh, around the report that they did. I downloaded it because uh, it, was, it was on one of, one, one of the links, so you can give away a few copies of the, uh, the physical printout of the report on acquiring and the state of the industry. So maybe kind of high level, we just start saying the takeaways, high level, what do you see um, takeaways from your report? Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I got a few copies of, of this with me. I would be really grateful if you could help me not to, to, to take them back. Uh, to, to Dubai and hopefully is going to prove an interesting read. Now, the, the merchant acquiring industry is going, has, has been undergoing continuous transformation since the very, very day that personally, at least, I've been able to, to witness it uh, from. And um, um, so we're talking about 23, 24 years of ongoing continuous reconfiguration of the value chain that is accelerating. Now, there are some drivers um, because of, of um, pushing it. The first one are the changes in the retail and consumer uh, spending landscape. Um, then we got regulation, and in Europe very much so with Payment Services Directive, that is, um, is the case. Uh, the establishment of uh, um, real-time rails uh, is also driving significant change, not yet as much in this region uh, as uh, it is happening way faster into others, but ultimately the, the world tends to, to move all in the same direction. It's just different speeds. Um, then we have uh, industry convergence. Um, the, the banking industry has been subject to industry convergence and overlapping with uh, the telco and the technology industry for quite, uh, for quite some time. Uh, and that has been one of the key drivers for the reconfiguration of the, the value chain. That is keeping happening uh, as of now with the, the, um, the borders between retail technology, for example, and payment technology keeping, keeping blurring. Um, obviously, we got technology as a driver. Um, um, and then finally, we got the rivalry into the industry. Um, the industry is a bit of counterintuitive. So if we look at the maturity model for any type of industry, uh, you got at the stage of maturity consolidation uh, with uh, very, very few players holding the majority of market share. This is not happening in the acquiring space. So if we look at the last uh, five years, uh, volumes globally have grown up 20% uh, higher uh, over, over the period. During this period of the time, the top 10 acquirer by, by volume, so the, the 10 largest one, have been growing at 20%. So practically they lost market share. If we keep expanding the sample to the top 100, is another 20%. And it is the rest of the market that is growing much faster and grabbing market share. So. This Why do you think that is? And also, is it a case there, if you look at the big US ones, are they losing share to Stripe and the new startups? And in Europe, are they losing share to Adyen and companies like Adyen? 
And so, is there a reason why they're, they're not growing at least as fast as the market is growing? So Europe is an industry, is a market that is seeing a little bit more consolidation out of the, the world, uh, world line, um, uh, Nexi and, and world line uh, uh, acquisitions and, and expansion, cross-border expansion. Nonetheless, uh, what we are seeing is, first of all, agility on the side of smaller players. Uh, the, the platforms of uh, larger players tend to become clunkier over time. So we have better services uh, out of newer platforms that have been developed by newer, uh, newer entrants. Uh. And then finally, we got an industry that is subject to quite a lot of lateral pressure with new business models emerging. And these new entrants are capturing volumes way, way faster by being closer to the merchant, having closer merchant intimacy, having the ability to reconfigure and rebundle the services in ways that larger players are not able to, either because of scale or because they are part of a wider financial services offering that is relying on a set of other touch points and relationships in order to retain the, the ownership of the, the customer. You think the big European ones, after this current wave of global and Evo and all of the, the Nexi, Netseer, all of those acquisitions, do you think that when, if they manage to do the platform upgrades that they'll uh, be able to grow share? Or rather, all of this for the next few years means they're going to find it very difficult because of the platform issues, the migration issues, the competitive issues, the new players who are a bit more agile? Well, it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. And, and you, you mentioned the re-platforming. Um, I got direct experience uh, uh, of uh, one big American uh, player uh, entering Europe and expanding globally out of acquisition, like First Data Corporation. Like we're talking about the, the, the 2000, uh, early 2000. And uh, as uh, the, the, the company changed strategy with the sale of, uh, of Western Union, there was practically the cash go that was funding all of these acquisitions, and the priority shifted to consolidation, then reality ended up coming to, to ground with the fact that it is not so easy to consolidate platforms uh, uh, and migrate them and migrate country portfolios from one to into another. Um, I, was, I was there for eight years, so I remember the adding on acquisitions, the difficulty of migration, and then in the end, you know, I'd left by the time they started doing all the divestments because they found it just too difficult and it's easier to focus on a few big markets and serve big customers. I mean, what do you think about the, well, I mean, what else is acquiring going to do for the retail segment over the next few years that is, that is better than they were, they were doing before around payments? You know, e-com, physical, omnichannel. Mm, so first of all, we have a convergence between the physical and the online uh, environment. And uh, this is driven out of technology, the Android pause, the, the virtualization of terminals that can be embedded into retail interfaces. Like for, uh, if, we, if we look at any large retailer, what was uh, a piece of iron that over time started having value added services and so on has become incredibly dumb right now because everything has been captured back into the teal infrastructure, loyalty and analytics and, and so on. Um, what we, we have uh, as, a, as a key trend that is, all, is universal once again, once we add payments uh, and VAS being on top uh, as an enriching type of service and value, value driving uh, element, now VAS has become the core product and payment it just happened to be embedded as an add-on to something else. Um, there is a, a very interesting emergence of a platform ecosystem type of value propositions that are focusing on providing retailers with the tools that they need in order to run their, their business. Uh, with the payment, just it just happened that it is embedded into it. So uh, payments, it has the risk of going like uh, telecoms, voice and data paid services into becoming a virtually free service, maybe on a monthly, on a monthly fee model and everything else on the cash system, all of the add-on products basically 
are loaded into the, the core mer merchant infrastructure, not the payment infrastructure. Yeah, that, that is one of the, the risks that we're seeing. Now, the, the zero price or the monthly subscription depends on the competitive pressure, the rivalry within, within the market. But on the other side, we've seen paradox like uh, merchants not caring anymore for the 2% of charge on, uh, on a square transaction uh, because what they really care for and they want uh, are all the other services that are provided through the, the square interface or the Stripe interface uh, that are practically providing them with a mini SME version of a, an ERP that is all they need in order to manage the, the business like entering suppliers, warehouse, the check-in, check-out of employees, and for restaurants, the table ordering, the loyalty, the, and, and so on. So, so payments as a revenue isn't going to disappear? Payment as a revenue is not going to disappear. We still got an exchange of value wherever there is a transaction. Uh, there is, well, the exchange of value can be a, a transfer of monetary value or a transfer of data. Um, and both of them have uh, intrinsic value in their own right. Uh, but the overall value equation within a commercial relationship is going to change. And I think it's interesting you say people don't mind 2% on Stripe because it has a lot of value-add services, but then there's probably a problem of paying even 1% at the POS in the merchant physical location where all it is is just an exchange of payment data with nothing virtually added on. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Well, in, in terms of pricing, we've seen over the last 20 years, some, some interesting type of dynam dynamics with merchant claims that uh, the cost of payment is an hidden tax on consumer, uh, interchange regulation coming in. Uh, as of now, personally, I've seen no evidence whatsoever out of uh, the congressional uh, investigations in the US and so on that any reduction in interchange has been passed on as a lower cost to consumer. We got wallets uh, even in Europe uh, that as a, on an average transaction value are costing more than the 0 020, 0 030. Nobody is complaining. Maybe they are not even realizing, but when you start doing the calculations, in some cases the, 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 the prices are, are higher than that. So it is a very, very interesting topic. I mean, merchant, merchant pricing, and then what are we pricing? Are we pricing the terminal? Are we pricing the subscription? Uh, depending on the transaction environment, uh, we have uh, uh, places and business models incredibly successful, like that of GHL system that started as a terminal uh, handler, terminal provider for, for big banks in, uh, for the, for the banks in Malaysia and Indonesia, that now is pushing out into, um, into areas where you have one car transaction per week and all the rest is wallets, uh, is by now pay later, is top ups, is, is mobile uh, e-money transactions and so on, and it's creating a completely different type of value equation. Even though we don't have super wallets in Poland, I think the last data was that 25, 30% transactions at, at the POS is through the phone, so Apple, Google. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and in there, uh, we are starting seeing Apple eating out uh, PayPal for lunch uh, out of um, a dynamic, a reinforcing dynamic where multiple factors such uh, personal preference because of fashion, lock-in because all of your friends are on the same chat and if somebody is chatting out of uh, a known uh, Apple device, the, the flag is different and the content is presented differently, so that creates a little bit of a stigma. Uh, the recent introduction of uh, the, the saving account uh, has been an amazing success. It was like, if I remember correctly, something like $5 billion collected in the first few weeks of operation in the US. That is driving further adoption of the device, and with the device you got uh, the, the, the wallet, 52% um, of Apple uh, iPhone owners uh, are on uh, Apple Pay. It's good having such a loyal customer base of uh, taking up a product. Absolutely. I mean, we have a few minutes, so maybe one topic. You know, in Europe, we have a lot of regulation. We have PSD3 coming. Yeah. We have a lot of real time. Do you think that's going to have some effect on the way payments are accepted at the merchant? Will it actually do anything for consumers and merchants when we have real time in every currency functioning? 
Yeah, so that, that, that's the sort of million dollar question and it's keeping coming up in every single acquiring conference in, in Europe. So uh, we got countries in which uh, real time is picking up to the point of having killed debit like in Thailand, um, Brazil, the, the uptake of real time payments is incredibly huge but for a very simple reason. Uh, the benefit of acquiring a transaction at point of sale is costing merchants about, or it was costing merchants at the last time we were down there working, about 4% with uh, um, the, the settlement to merchant taking place over a period of about one month. So it's a month of working capital. When you got something like that and you have a payment system that is coming in and is charging per click a fraction of, of what the car transaction is, is becoming ubiquitous because of wallets uh, and you get the cash in straight away then you can you can have a very interesting dynamic in terms of demand acceptance and uh, and um, consumer willingness to to use it also because going around with cash in in some parts of South America is not a very smart idea. Uh, so are the acquirers very worried in Europe when, when you speak with them at uh, the conferences? Because in Poland, I mean, Blix eat and everything else in the in internet world, yeah. but it's not, it's not a per click and it's not cheap and it's, it's good for the consumer and it's good for the merchant because it enables the consumer to get through the, the whole payment process. But I haven't seen anywhere in Europe at the POS super real-time PISP payments through PSD3 at a click version yet? Not yet, and uh, I think it's going to take a while, personally, as a personal expectation, for a very simple reason. If I pay with a card, I got payment guarantees, uh, I got the ability to dispute a transaction, uh, the card is nearly ubiquitous, it's not that I, I have a blank space uh, in the market that I need to address uh, where consumers are not able to pay because they cannot afford to have a card or the card is not accepted. Uh, so the overall competitive dynamics uh, are very much driving the speed of adoption. Uh, and it is ultimately the value to the consumer. If we look at uh, the most successful payment innovation around the world, going from M-Pesa to anything else, they were addressing a specific need, a so-called, in say a term, the problem to be solved for a consumer or a merchant. Without a problem to be solved, it is unlikely that any type of solution will be able to gain traction without the ability to create differential value versus the status quo compared to the other, to the other, to the, to the incumbent services. Here we're just saying it could be cheaper and it could be similar in time, but it isn't offering uh, a huge step up in, in any differential uh, experience for the consumer. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you've got uh, behavioral inertia. There's a number of other factors that, that are behind it too. I don't know whether you want to listen to us. I think we could talk for hours on this because this, you know, I've been in the industry for 20 something years as well, like yourself. And it's, uh, it's fascinating that after all these years, everything still keeps changing constantly. You would have thought by now that maybe everything would have slowed down and we would have got to some solid state, but it's, um, it's, it's constant. Absolutely. So, so I think because the next session is coming, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. I, I hope you enjoyed at least our short discussion on this. Thank you very much for listening.